For our Bible study time, I want to invite you to Matthew chapter 13. If you have your Bible handy, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew 13 as we talk about tares and tears. Tares and tears. Matthew 13, Jesus gives a parable you've heard before about the wheat and the tares. And tares represent evil or evil ones that live among wheat, uh, those who are following the Lord. And the coexistence between wheat and tares, godly and ungodly, good and evil, leads to some trials, leads to some suffering in this world, and leads to some tears. And so if that is your experience, maybe you're facing a trial right now, maybe you're coming out of a trial or a trial is right around the corner uh, that is causing you some tears. Maybe some of these things that all of us are up against these days have caused you some, to ask some questions. And so we look to Matthew 13 for a biblical perspective on how to navigate a life that is a, a coexistence and a mixture of uh, godly and ungodly, people who want to follow the Lord and those who do not, and what God's plan is for us in all of this. We'll look at three questions brought up in this text and the answers that the Lord gives either as he uh, explains the parable or as he, uh, the father is represented as the, father, as the farmer within the parable. Matthew 13 and beginning in verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Tares are a kind of weed, uh, most likely the darnel seed, which uh, in the early stages of growth is nearly indistinguishable from the wheat. Uh, but as the plants grow to maturity, it's very obvious which is which. And so verse 27 tells us that the servants of the household came and said unto him, unto the farmer, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them into bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Some obvious lessons from a parable there. Uh, sometimes uh, difficult to distinguish exactly what the Lord meant. But in some cases, unfortunately in this one, we are provided with an explanation, an interpretation of the parable. The disciples ask and Jesus answers in verse 36. It says that Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. So the one uh, planting in the field is Jesus. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So the wheat are followers of the Lord, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The Bible says those who uh, choose not to trust Christ as Savior, uh, God is not their heavenly father. They are of their father, the devil. To be uh, one who rejects Christ is to be a spiritual child of Satan, one who follows evil and spiritual darkness. To trust Christ as Savior is to become a son of God. And so the tares, the weeds, represent those who have rejected the Lord and are children uh, spiritually of the wicked one. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. It's the devil that's sowing discord in our world and spreading sin. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. That those who uh, choose to reject Christ uh, will be gathered and uh, thrown into punishment. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, verse 41, and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Uh, 
there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. As the Lord shares this parable, he wants us to know that the punishment is real, that hell, the lake of fire, is a real place, and it's not a pleasant place, and those who fail to trust Christ as Savior are destined there because of their sin, but God wants us to be followers of him. He wants us to be sons and daughters of the kingdom, to trust Christ as Savior and be wheat that would bear fruit for him in this world and uh, live for him and with him in the next. Well, this uh, explanation helps us to uh, get some biblical perspective about trials that we face in this world, this life that we share with unbelievers and this uh, environment we live in that is plagued by evil. It's all around us. And the people in the Bible, uh, both in the parable and the disciples after the parable, ask some questions, and the Lord's answers are very insightful. The first question is, why is there evil and suffering? The servants ask this question in verse 27, from whence then hath it tares? Lord, didn't you plant good seed in this field? Where have the tares come from? This is a question that we face in life. Lord, didn't you create the world good? Lord, Uh, Didn't you create us to live in harmony and to do right? From whence then hath it tares? Lord, where did all this evil come from? Why is there such conflict in the world? Why is there such injustice? Why do God's people suffer? The answer is that an enemy has done this. Verse 28, uh, the, the Lord of the field uh, gives this answer to the, to the servants, an enemy has done this. Uh, The Lord wants us to know that the evil in this world is not from Him. Uh, He's not the author of evil. An enemy has done this. When we look around in the world and we see evil and we see suffering and we experience in our lives trials and suffering and and we uh, suffer injustice at the hands of, of the unsaved or our peaceful environment is disrupted by the godless, uh, the Lord wants us to know that an enemy has done this. It's not the Lord's doing. Yes, the Lord can use uh, the suffering in this world to teach us and, and even to mold us, to shape us, even to chasten us. But all suffering is the result of sin and Satan. An enemy has done this. Why is there evil in the world? Because of the enemy, because of our choices to sin, because of Adam and Eve choosing to break God's rule and our choices to reinforce that and Satan's influence in this world. That's where the suffering comes from. That is the source. The second question is at the end of verse 28 when the servants say, Wilt thou then that we should go and gather them up? Uh, Our question would be, Lord, why don't you remove the evil from this world. Uh, Those who are hardened in their hearts who will not choose to follow you, why do you allow them to live among us? Uh, Why do you allow us to continue to struggle with sin? Why do you allow us to continue to face trials and to suffer injustice and to feel the hurt? The answer that the master of the field gives in verse 29 is, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat also with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And so the answer, why doesn't Jesus take the evil away? The answer is that one day he will. One day he will. He's waiting for the appropriate time. Why does the master allow the weed to continue alongside the wheat? Notice something very carefully. What reason did the master give for not plucking up the weeds once they were discovered? He said, lest the wheat be brought up also. See, the weeds would intermingle their roots in with with the wheat's roots. And so to to pull up the weeds uh, prematurely would harm the wheat. And so notice there that the trials, the evil, the evil people, that the devil, all of these uh, sources of suffering and injustice in our lives are allowed to remain for the wheat's sake. See, the reason Jesus didn't, uh, the master of the field doesn't command the weeds be pulled up is not because he doesn't see that they are a problem. It's not that he doesn't know about them. It's not because he doesn't know that they will harm the wheat. It's not because he uh, is powerless to remove them or that he doesn't care about the wheat or value the wheat. No, it is because he values and loves the wheat that he permits the evil tares 
to stay. And so in some way, in some level, it is for the good of the wheat that the tares are allowed temporarily to stay. That's the second question. Why don't you take away evil, Lord? Lord, you want us to take the tares away? And Jesus says, no, it's, it's not time. And the evil that we face in life, we can recognize that God will one day deal with it. In the meantime, it is left here in some way for our benefit. Sometimes we can't imagine how this could be to our benefit, how God could use uh, such a hard trial that you might be facing to shape us, to mold us. But God knows that if he took all evil away right now, if he took all evil ones away right now, that it would not be best for the fruit-bearing servants that are still following him on earth. Well, there's one more question here in the text, and it's the one the disciples ask in verse 36. Lord, will you explain the meaning of this parable to us? The Lord does this, giving uh, uh, one-for-one explanations of what the different elements of the parable symbolize. But I stopped reading before verse 43. This is part of the explanation that wasn't part of the parable. It's as if the Lord tags it on at the end to give the fuller purpose of the parable. And so the question is, what does it all mean? Lord, why, uh, if, if it's for our good, how can this be? How can good come from all of this? What does it all mean? And Jesus' answer uh, culminates in verse 43 when he says, Then shall the righteous, this is after the, the harvest, the judgment day, when the evil are judged and the good, those who follow the Lord, sons of the kingdom, are, are to be rewarded in his presence. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. If you have ears, if you can hear anything, hear this, that when the end comes, when the day of harvest comes and the Lord judges evil and brings his own to be with him, we will shine forth like the sun. Well, what does that mean? I'm afraid I don't really know, but I do know that in the book of Exodus and chapter 34, verse 35, the Bible tells us that when Moses came down from being in God's presence, that his face shone so brightly that the children of Israel couldn't look at him. I know that a few chapters later here in the book of Matthew, we'll read about Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain. And the Bible says in Matthew 17, verse 2, that his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. People in God's presence experiencing his God's God's blessing that shine like the sun. And the Lord says that in the day of harvest, When evil is finally dealt with and good is finally rewarded, those who are faithful to him will shine like the sun. We're supposed to be light in this world. Sometimes it's hard for that light to shine through when there's so much evil around us and and so many obstacles to that light. Uh, We have some vents at our house fan vents or dryer vents come outside the house. And maybe some of you have had this same problem with birds nesting inside the vents of your house. Well, this can be a hazard. It can be a fire hazard and also uh, bring other undesirable elements to your your house. And so we knew that we had to get some vent covers uh, to keep the birds from nesting in our house. Uh, But we knew that you can't put a vent cover on when there's when there's an inhabited nest inside that vent. And so we had to wait for the baby birds to get big enough to fly away and and nest elsewhere so that we could clean out the vents. Well, in the meantime, one or two people told us, hey, you you know you have birds coming and going, and that's not very safe. And we we knew that. We knew it was a problem, but we were waiting till the right time to deal with those weeds that were piled up in the vents. Well, the right time was this past Monday when I got up on a ladder and, and took off the vent covers and, and reached in. And you can see a picture of some of what I found, quite a few weeds that had got in there and uh, choked up the vent hole. And as I reached in to pull those out, some were too far back to reach and had to reach in with a long wire and try to pull some of that out. Um, and it's pretty dark in those vents, so I had to get a flashlight and try to see what was back in there. Well, the light was obstructed by uh, the, the weeds that were there in the vent. 
Uh, but with the light shining, I could see where the weeds were and reach my tool in and pull some of it out. The problem was the vent hole is maybe about the size of a grapefruit. And so with my arm in there, uh, there's not much room for my big head to, to get an eyeball in there and to hold a flashlight with the other hand is, is pretty tricky. So I found if I held the flashlight at just the right angle, uh, there would be just enough light to see where the problem was and pull those barriers to airflow out and uh, make our home a safe environment again. Well, the birds are the bad guy in that illustration, and Sarah wouldn't appreciate that. She felt bad for those birds whose nest was being dismantled. But the moral of the story is, it's hard for the light to get through uh, when the barriers are there, but God gives us enough so that we can, that we can get past that. And when finally all of those weeds will remove, were removed, as one day evil will be, I shine the light in that hole again, and it was a joy to see a clear path, an open hole for that light to shine brightly. Well, one day we can shine brightly if we stay faithful to the Lord. We're told in Proverbs chapter 4 that the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Let's shine for the Lord and allow Him to use trials to make us brighter so that we can shine radiantly for Him in glory one day. Six reminders when you face a trial that you can tell yourself as you think of the tears and the tears. Number one, suffering starts with sin and Satan. Jesus said, an enemy hath done this. We ought to know that it's not the Lord's doing that when we face trials. Oh, yes, He can use them, but the suffering, the sin, the the death, uh, the the struggles that we face come from, ultimately, from sin and Satan. And so tell yourself as you face that trial, suffering comes from sin and Satan. Suffering comes from sin and Satan. Suffering comes from sin and Satan. Number two, God sees and knows about the problem. It wasn't that the farmer didn't know about the tares. Don't make the mistake of thinking that an apparent lack of action on God's part in the midst of your trial is a lack of empathy. God does see. He is going to act. And so tell yourself in the midst of a trial, God sees and knows. God sees and knows. God sees and knows. Number three, it's only temporary. The Lord has told us that the day is coming when He will remove the unrighteousness and when He will bring right, the righteous ones to Himself. So tell yourself in the midst of trial, it's only temporary. It's only temporary. It's only temporary. Number four, it's for my good. We don't know how trials will work out for our good. Sometimes we won't, won't know till years later, maybe not till the next life or maybe never. But we trust that the Lord leaves the tares for the good of the wheat. And it's for my good is something you can repeat to yourself in the midst of a trial. It's for my good. It's for my good. Number five, God will make it right. Someday justice will prevail. No unrepentant evil will go unpunished. And no righteousness uh, done through Christ will go unrewarded. And so in the midst of your trial, remind yourself, God will make it right. God will make it right. God will make it right. And finally, it will help me to shine. It will help me to shine that God is using this trial in my life to make me more radiant for Him in His presence one day. And though we don't know everything about what that means, we want to shine for Him. We want to uh, reflect His glory as we are in His presence. And so just as a polish on silver makes it cloudy at first, when the shining is finished, it shines more brilliantly than ever before. So tell yourself in the midst of trial, it in the midst of trial, it will help me to shine. It will help me to shine. This will help me to shine. Michael, the archangel, told Daniel something about the last days, the same last days that Jesus refers to as the harvest. And Daniel chapter 12 says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, 
and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. That you and I in this life have an opportunity to turn others to righteousness. A tear can't change into wheat, but a godless person can turn to the light and become a wheat stalk that would be written in the book of life so that at that judgment time we can shine all the brighter because we helped someone else to turn to. Keep these reminders and these perspectives in mind as you face trials this week.